بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد a group of people worshipped God out of fear this is the worship of slaves a group of people worship God for desire of reward this is the worship of traders a group of people worship God out of gratefulness this is the worship of the free the first of our loud salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam A second even louder salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam A third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa-Zaman Allahumma salam wa dua'ala Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Why do we worship God is a question which is discussed quite wonderfully in Hadith 237 of Nahj al balagha Imam Ali alayhi salam covers the area of worshipping God for without a doubt in his time, like it is today, it's a central question. Why is it that I worship God? What is the reason that I perform everything that I perform in my life? As a man devoted to the religion of Islam, as in when I come in the holy month of Ramadan, why is it that I fast all of these fasts? Why the commitment to do all of these things? Why is it that I pray five times a day, every day throughout the year? Why do I once in my lifetime go to Hajj? Why do I have such commitment, especially on the 19th, the 21st and the 23rd of Ramadan, that I'm willing to read page after page of Arabic that I don't understand but I'm still gonna make sure that I stay up the whole night and tick box each of them reality is that this is a central question we need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves that when I practice what I practice what is my intention behind the practice my intention behind the practice ultimately will show me where I am in the eyes of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Further than that, it will also reveal to me how exactly I view the God that I call Allah, or that I call Jehovah, or that I call Elohim, or any of the names that someone gives God. Because this question of why do you worship God is not just a question that affects me as a Muslim. It's a question that affects a Hindu, that affects a Sikh, that affects a Christian, that affects a Jew, each and every one of us who worship God, irrespective of how we define God's look, irrespective of how we define God's attributes, ultimately we all have to ask ourselves, why is it that we worship God? And that's why when an atheist comes and asks us this question, 
The atheist has got a point in all honesty. Because the atheist says, why does God need your 23rd night a'mal? If God is so powerful, and God is so blessed, and God is all-seeing, and all the treasures of the heavens and the earth belong to God, what difference will it be to God, me reading Abu Hamza Thamali for one and a half hours? Why should I be doing this? As an I could have been, if I look at God, I have to turn around and say, is God a narcissist? Is God insecure? Is God someone who wants our praise? Because if you ask any Muslim in the world today, why did God create us? Because ultimately that's the base question. Worship comes secondary to this one. One of the classic answers you'll always get from a Muslim is the ayah in the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create the jinn, nor did I create the humans except to worship me. Well, why do you need my worship? I don't get it. If I think about it again, let me ask the question in a different way. God creates me and then tells me that I have to perform the following set of actions. If I perform them, then God has created a place called Jannah. And as a reward for me praying and fasting and staying up the whole night, he's going to give me a nice house in Jannah. And that house in Jannah is a nicely decorated house. And apparently the house has billions of emeralds that I've never seen. And there's a river outside the house with milk flowing. Because alcohol here is haram. So we're going to get halal alcohol there. And that over there as well, we are going to have partners. And those partners await us. And it's because of that, that we do everything that we do. So in other words, God created me so that he could watch me, obey him. And then God said, okay. As a reward for you, young man, here is Jannah. If you tell that to someone today, it's not like telling them in Mombasa in 1975. Tell them in Mombasa in 1975, person will listen to anything you say to him because he knows there's a ruler there. And that ruler, if it gets used, I remember someone a couple of days ago said to me, said, Ammar, you, when you judge on Shia voice, you are a bit harsh on one of your contestants who was on Shia voice, the boy who was reciting Quran, you could have said to him different words. I said, this is ironic. Ironic. Coming from a madhab that used to pride itself on Mawlana's hitting people who make mistakes in Quran. We have come a long way. Now we only talk. How many of you got the odd slap when you recited an ayah wrong? Sometimes verbal is different to a ruler being slapped in your head. Maybe a person should remember those who were people looking a lot more religious than I am when they used to do that. But anyway, so we used to get slapped around because we were trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when I look at this, the atheist turns around and says, your God, I'm not understanding him. If you do well in life, your God promises you an amazing Jannah. But this loving God of yours, if you make mistakes in life, has got a burning hellfire waiting for you. When I therefore look at all of this, it begs the question that what's the meaning of my worshipping of God? Why do I worship God? How did I come to the conclusion of worshipping what I worship? If I was born in an atheist family, do you think I would have converted to Islam or no? Am I what I am today as a Muslim because of my unbelievable intellectual inquiry and analysis into the metaphysical and the cosmological? Or is it because I'm born into a house where my mom's called Fatima and my dad's called Ali and we went to the same Imam Barga and I am what I am? Reality is that when Mawla discussed worship in Nahj al Balagha, Mawla wanted to highlight, not everybody you see on the 23rd night of Shah Ramadan is on the same level of ibadah. Nor is everybody who has a sajda mark, nor is everybody who's wearing unbelievable clothing, where they look like the most religious person in the world. The only tattoo they have on them is that of a sajda mark. Those people, Mawla wanted to highlight, that when you look at these, don't straight away think that worship 
is viewed the same by God. On the contrary, Muslims, our concept of worship may have been far away from the way that was intended by Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Rather, when a person looks at how Mawla intends worship, you see that the dynamic changes all of a sudden. The flavor changes all of a sudden. It no longer becomes a conception of Islam. It becomes a conception of the nature of the human being. What Amir al-Mu'mineen does in this hadith and others in Nahj al-Balagha is he allows us to open the doors of the discussion that not everyone at mosque is always on the same level. There is a criteria. In this sermon, he rips that criteria into pieces. Let's examine Hadith 237 of Nahj al balagha And I'd like to do this in the following stages. Number one, what is the purpose of God creating us? And ultimately, what is our purpose on this earth? Number two, was Marx right when he said that religion is the opiate of the masses? And what did he mean when he opened that particular equation? Number three, how do I come to know my Lord when it comes to worship? Number four, how did the prophet say that an hour of something is greater than 70 years of something else? Number five, how did Mola say the first group of worshippers are those who only come to mosque because they're scared of a place called hell? The second group are those who only come to mosque because they just want heaven. But what was the problem with these two? Is it a bad level for a person to be scared of hell or to be someone who wants heaven? Especially if the Quran tells us to race for heaven. Therefore, is Mawla saying something negative or is Mawla rather saying keep trying to rise in the ladder? Don't remain stagnant where you are in Ibadah. Further than that, how do Ahlul Bayt salam, highlight in their own life that when they performed an action, they didn't want the people to thank them, nor did they want any rewards or accolades. Rather, it was done on a completely higher level. If that's the case, what then becomes the definition of worship according to Ahlul Bayt salam? And finally, on the plains of Karbala, when Imam al Hussein salam, was lying on the ground with arrows all over his body, how did he explain in one line that, oh human being, whether you're Muslim or not, at least try and be a free human being? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. When a person asks the question, why do we worship God? The first point of that question has to be, what is the purpose of our creation? If I was to ask each and every one of you, what's the purpose of our creation? How would you answer it? If you tell me the purpose of our creation is to worship God, I'll be like, number one, that's circular because that's in the Quran and you claim the Quran is the word of God. Number two, I'm still not understanding that what is it about worshiping God that God needs? You create me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that I go down and sujood to you. Why did you need my sujood? I thought you're not in need. You don't need anything from us. Therefore, how do I answer this question determines then why I worship Allah. The answer to this question, of course, became the subject of great philosophical discussion. A six-year-old and a 70-year-old can both ask this question. Don't you agree? Haven't you had your kids one day say, why did God create us? Why are we on this earth? It is arguably the most important question in human history. And because it's the most important question, if you can answer this question, then Ibadah tastes different. But if you can't answer this question, Ibadah becomes boring. There are many who pray today, but in sujood, Subhana Rabbi, I've got a meeting at 12.36. In sujood, subhana rabbi al-a'la, what's the score? I bet it's half time now. Let me check in a second. There are many, their ibadah went to that direction. Why? The reason was they couldn't answer the first question. Why are we here? Why were we created? If a person answers this, and that's why France had a rise of philosophers 
who are known as existentialists. When you hear the names such as, for example, Jean-Paul Sartre, amongst others, these were a group of existentialists. What was existential philosophy? Trying to answer this question. That what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is the purpose of creation? Existentialists, what do they say? You've got to find your own meaning of life. And then when you find your own meaning of life, then you decide what is it that brings you that banaa or that certainty or that contentment. For them, if a person decides to commit suicide and he's realized that life's meaning is that when I'm not feeling it anymore, I commit suicide, so be it. So if I saw someone like Albert Camus, for example, committing suicide, or I saw others encouraging suicide, why? Because in an existentialist framework from the French philosophers, what do they turn around and say? This life, what is the mean meaning of this life? You've got to find. There is no metaphysical meaning to this life. Meaning of this life is what you decide is the meaning of life. Do you get bored? You're not interested? Life's a pain? Baba, get a shovel, get a rope and hang yourself and get rid. Why? There's no concept of accountability, no concept of qiyamah. Anarchy produces order for them. A set of proteins and amino acids produce Einstein for them. So therefore, for them, in reality, they said that there isn't no meaning on a metaphysical plane. What I see has meaning. What I smell has meaning. What I taste has meaning. What I touch has meaning. Then on the other hand, the religious answer. Again, I'm going to pose this again. Why are we here? What's the meaning of life? Why were we created? What's the purpose of life? If Muslims can answer this, and the answer is very simple, by the way. Too many of us, especially in my position, straight jump to Allah did not create us except to worship him. And then you get confused. Atheist doubts come into your head and you're like, hold on, that just doesn't click. But I've got to listen to him because he's a Mawlana and Mawlana just said that from the Quran. The reason, the purpose, the meaning of life for us, what is the meaning of life? Is to find happiness. The meaning of life. Everyone's answer has to be that simple. The meaning of life for every human being is to find happiness. The Greeks would call it arete. You try and find that ultimate happiness. If you can find that happiness, the ball game of ibadah changes. Simple. The meaning of life is that I have to find the path to happiness, the pursuit to happiness. There is definitely a meaning to why I'm here. Because when a person says to me, why do you believe in religion? Why do you worship God? I turn around to them and say, I'm in disbelief that you don't worship God. Turn it round. That person psychologically puts you in a corner. Why do you worship God? Why do you believe in God? Turn it around and say, I can't believe that you don't worship God. How could you believe? Number one, in a worldview where something comes out of nothing, I still don't understand. How could something come out of nothing? That's number one. Number two, how could anarchy produce order? I don't know if you found how anarchy produces the order of this universe. They admit that there is anarchy happening. They haven't found the answers, but it produces the order of the universe I'm in. How does ignorance produce knowledge? An animal can result into hawking. Please explain how. How? A simple fish at the bottom of the sea can produce a mind like Einstein. That is something which is unbelievable. That is something that I cannot understand. So for me, therefore, when someone says to me, meaning of life, meaning of life for me is that I'm seeking to achieve happiness. Happiness through what? Through an intellectual conclusion that something could not come out of nothing. That order cannot come out of anarchy. That knowledge cannot come out of ignorance. That there has to be an order to all of this. Where I am the effect, before me was a cause. Before that was an effect, before that was a cause. Until I come back to a necessary first cause. When I come back to that first cause, that's necessary, whatever you want to call it, I reach the conclusion that that first cause is called God. The moment, listen, this is intellectual, rather than inheritance of religion from mom and dad. If I inherit religion from mom and dad, salah becomes boring. 
I just want to do anything to rebel from my parents. I have no interest in religion. Whereas for us, especially the Shia, let me focus on this if you don't mind. The Shia is a school where aql and intellect is primary for us. Aql is primary. I did not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through my eyes. I found Allah through my aql. I looked around. I was trying to find the pursuit of happiness. My pursuit of happiness as a human being originally came from where? Originally, it came from the idea that I want to see order to why I'm here. Why do I exist? Where am I heading? What am I made up of? When I realize what I'm made up of, what's my identity? Subhanallah, Islam again, wonderful. Islam tells me my identity is not purely physical. My identity, there is a soul as well in my identity. Okay, when I know there's a soul in my identity, please focus on this point. If I know that I'm made up of body and soul, we agree? I'm made up of body and soul. What's the pharmacy for my body called? What's the most famous pharmacy in Birmingham? Give me a name. Masters. Okay. Masters, mashallah, must be higher than boots. And inshallah, they get higher than boots. But let's say masters. Someone online is probably thinking that's some English family called the master. No problem. Masters Pharmacy in Birmingham. MashaAllah, I go to them as a human. My pursuit is happiness. I've come to a realization in my pursuit of happiness that I am someone, I think, therefore I am. I'll use Descartes at this moment. I now have a meaning to my life. I'm seeking that happiness. Once I seek that happiness, I need a route to that happiness. I know myself that I'm made up of body and I'm made up of soul. My body, for me, I need to make sure is in the most pristine shape. So if my body is affected by certain diseases, where do I go? Masters. Do you agree? Uh, do I reach masters? I say to masters. I say to the masters, Salamu alaykum, alaykum salam. My body, I, for example, have a headache. They tell me, here you go. I, for example, have a migraine. Here you go. I, for example, have this. Here you go. Whatever I need, they give me. But I also want that body to be a body that isn't just settling for when I'm in trouble or I'm not feeling well. I also want it to be a body where I can have a six-pack, inshallah. Although with your diets, <laughs> la ilaha illallah. Biryani yesterday, karma today, my Lord Almighty. Inshallah khair. It tastes nice. But dreams of a six-pack go quickly. Anyway, I want my body to be in pristine shape. In this pursuit of happiness, for my body to be in pristine shape, what do I do? I make sure that there are exercises. You know where I'm heading now. There are certain exercises for my body. Those exercises allow my body to reach the ultimate state. Correct? Why I do those exercises? differs from one person to another. One group, they do those exercises, what? Out of fear of a heart attack. His dad's had a heart attack, the other has a stent, the other has a bypass. He's like, my Lord, those pyres and naharis and biryanis have destroyed the family. So out of fear for them, I'm going to make sure that I go to the gym. Their level of looking after the physical body is what? Is out of fear. They want to make sure that they look after their physical body out of fear of what? Out of fear of a heart attack. There's a second group who go to the gym. When they go to the gym, why do they go? Because they just want to make sure they get the perks of looking good. True? Look, it's nice when you walk on the beach and you don't look like somebody who's gained a few pounds. It's nice when you can fit into your Oliver Browns or your Vilbrequins and you're walking down and some of you may be looking at me thinking, what's he on about? Others of you may be looking thinking, he knows the shorts that I wear. And you are looking good. If we're on Jumeirah Beach and we're walking down, we don't want to be wearing a baggy t-shirt. You want to be looking good. So your knee for your second level of your existence on the physical plane is what? Your knee on the second level of physical plane is what? Is out of desire for rewards. There's a few perks with looking good in life, true?
Some people, when they offer you a job, if you're looking trim in the suit, they give you the job straight away. If you're not, the guy just has one look at you and he's like, mm, no, sorry, because you're not going to fit into this store, this environment, looking like this. So one group of people, when they were looking after themselves in their pursuit of happiness, remember Will Smith's film? pursuit of happiness when uh, one group of people they're in their pursuit of happiness they were looking they recognized that they are made up of the physical when they recognized they're made up of the physical they made sure that either they did things out of fear of or they did things out of reward of but the highest group of the people who looked after their physical bodies were who focus on me if you don't mind The highest group were those who said reward or no reward. This body is an amana from God. True. Whether I look good in it, whether I get a job with it, it doesn't matter. I have been given a trust from my Lord. Why am I not looking after my heart rate, my sugar levels? Why am I not looking after the organs of my body? Therefore, that third group of people said, whether there's a reward of people telling me I look great, I don't look great. On the third level, their highest was, thank you, God. You've been so kind to me that I have eyes others cannot see. And I have ears and others cannot hear. And I have the senses and others cannot smell. And I can touch, and others may have lost their limbs. I can walk, and others lost their feet in a landmine or something. Those people don't need the incentive of looking good. Those people recognize that what God has given them was more than enough for them to come back and be grateful to God for their body. What I just described about the physical body, Ali ibn Abi Talib describes for the soul. Your body... You fear something, masters. We want supplements. Maybe masters might do a contract with me and will advertise supplements. Third level is desire of what? Just gratefulness. How about when your soul needs something? If I go to Mr. Master, I don't think I've met Mr. Master, but I might probably meet him by the end of today's advertising for his company. If I go now to them, masters, I say, guys, I am in the pursuit of happiness. Mr. Master will look at me. He'll be like, are you okay, buddy? So I say, no, 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 no. Listen to me. Please, please listen to me. I'm in a pursuit of happiness as a human being, having realized that I am an effect of a cause and that there was a first cause. There's order to this universe. That cause was the one who created me out of his mercy hence he begins every chapter of the quran with the word mercy apart from one so he created me mercy by its nature gives out distribute so i'm a, a result of mercy now i mr master have been made up of body and soul my reason for coming to your pharmacy today is i uh, have a problem with my uh, with myself. Is that like, what do you have? I said I have a major problem with envy. So if you could give me paracetamol. And Mr. Master turns around and says to me, "Envy?" I say, "Yeah, I've got a disease of hasad, really bad. I don't like seeing others do well." So I've got this disease called envy. And my Christian friend has it, and my Jewish friend has it, my Hindu friend has it, my Buddhist friend has it, my Sikh friend has it. We've all we've, we've got this disease. We don't like to see others happy in their marriages or happy with their businesses. So could you uh, give me something over the counter? Say, I'm sorry, we're a pharmacy for the bodies. Ali ibn Abi Talib was a pharmacy for the soul. <laughs> you see where I'm heading? Understand? Religion and the reason I worship Allah is because I found a set of actions in my pursuit for happiness that allow me to look after my soul and my body. So when someone says to me, why do you worship God? I say, because in my pursuit of happiness, my gratefulness to God could be actualized in a set of actions that will show my Lord how grateful I am for what he's given me. Yes?
In my body, I'm grateful for. So how do I prove my gratefulness for my body? I won't allow rubbish to enter my body. True? Why does Islam say certain things are haram for you to eat? Why pork and alcohol? Haram to eat pork, haram to drink alcohol. Why? I see my mates on Friday night in Birmingham. They're all going. They're all on the lash. I see others who are enjoying these great looking burgers. Sometimes I, you know, sometimes I go to football matches and when I'm outside the ground, the smell of that hot dog, wallah, kills me. I think one of the first things I'm going to do when I, inshallah, get to Jannah. Please forgive me of all my sins. But if I get to Jannah, I say, Ya Allah, that hot dog outside the football grounds, the haram one, make a halal version for me here in Jannah. Yes? Now, coming back to that, therefore, what am I doing? I have now come to a conclusion that worshipping Allah is not an ends. It's a means. The ends is finding happiness in this world. Worship, salah, psalm, hajj, zakat, khums. These are means to finding happiness. When I stay away from alcohol, why did God make alcohol haram and pork haram? Because he's saying that that body of yours, don't let those things in. Those things may inhibit your faculties of reasoning. Those things may bring about certain diseases, may even affect you. You are what you eat, the non-Muslim says. So therefore, I look after the physical. Ibadah, worship, if done properly. And that's where Mawla takes it to another league. If, Mo if you follow how Mawla does it, then you'll see that ibadah is a set of exercises that my personal instructor in the gym who tells me, mate, get on the treadmill. And I'm like, I hate the treadmill. He's like, get on the treadmill. I'm like, but the treadmill is boring. Can't we get to biceps and triceps and lift and so on? He'll say, no, 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 no. One by one, one by one, then you'll look after your body. Likewise, 23rd night, 21st night, 15 Sha'ban, 13th Rajab. All of these were the gym exercises for the soul of the religion of Islam. Yes? So what does Mawla do in Nahj al balagha Look at the art of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He, said, he divides those who do ibadah into three. Beautifully. Beautifully. They are divided into three. And no one thing, the highest of them always is going to be one. Which is what? What our Prophet said, an hour of reflection is greater than 70 years of ibadah. One hour of reflection is greater than 70 years of ibadah. There are many who did 70 years of ibadah, but it was dry worship. Had they reflected on one line of that dua, makaram al-akhlaq, that they recited every year, their akhlaq with their brother who they don't chat to would have changed that year. What does he say in Dua Makarim al-Akhlaq? He says, Oh Allah, make the hate of my enemies into love for me. How many of you have prayed for someone who's hurt you in life? You've said, Ya Allah, change their hearts or we love each other. <laughs> Where's Zain al-Abideen? Where's his Shia? What have we resulted in doing? Have you made dua makar al akhlaq Make sure it's done. And if it's not done, I'm going to complain to the committee. You've missed the point completely. I always tell people, I always tell them, do all the a'mal. And if you want to chill in one of them and not read, just chill and listen. Sit there. Just read the translation. Because if one line of that translation in those six hours changes your life, that's shahar Ramadan complete for you. You, those a'mal that we do in the month of Ramadan, those a'mal were a means, not the ends. We made them the ends, not the means. They were a means for us to become better human beings. Ibadah in Islam is not the ends. It is the means for you to become a better person. If you and your family member or you and your community member are still enemies of each other one month after majalis and a'mal of shahar Ramadan, then you've not understood ibadah in Islam. Ibadah in Islam, an hour of reflection. How many of us are going to come 23rd night? Six hours we're going to sit on the 23rd night. One hour of reflection on that night where you don't even have to pick up mafati. Leave it. Just leave it there. Sit there. 
Ask yourself, who is not my friend in this jama'at? Let me go up to them this year and say salamu alaikum to them. Let me go up to them, the one I haven't spoken to for a while. Let me send an Eid message this year to someone in the family who we don't talk. That's ibadah. Ibadah is a transformation of one's soul. In the same way the gym is a transformation of your body. Imam, what does he then do in Najr Balagha? He says there are three types of people who do ibadah. Number one, let's see where we all fit in, Birmingham Jama'at and the rest of the people watching online. The first group who do ibadah, who are they? He said a group of people worship Allah out of fear. This is slaves. They're the ones, they worship God, but purely out of fear. Majalis of Mawlanas who talk about Qabr, they love. You know, there are some Mawlanas, they actually got the nickname Mawlana Mot and Qabr and Malik al Mot. By the way, let me be frank. In Nahj al-Balagha, Imam attacks those. In Nahj al-Balagha, Imam attacks those. Not that the Quran doesn't have verses about death and qabr and qiyamah. But if your whole preaching pushes people away from religion, Imam attacks them in Nahj al-Balagha. Baba, I know when I talk about hell, if I'm talking about hell and qabr and qiyamah, it's not to put fear into you. But it's to tell you why are you going to go that low when you were born on the path of Ahlul Bayt. See the difference? See the difference? I can either say to you, Wallah, those ladies who don't wear hijab, there will be molten lead through their ears and their brain will explode in Jahannam. Or I can turn around and say, Really? Yani, what all those ladies of Al Muhammad did at Karbala is not enough for you? That they could wear a hijab, they could fight the Islamophobia of their time, they could still be eloquent and educated. Is that not enough? Do you see how you change it? Mawla says, the first group of those who worship, they do everything out of fear. I'm going to pray namaz. Why are you praying? Because if mom finds out I am prayed, bro, I'm getting slapped. That really is namaz? Really? Or is namaz, you know what ibadah really is? We call ibadah worth striping. When you show the worth of Allah in your actions. Your ibadah is what Allah means to you. The air that I could breathe, is it not enough for me to go into sujood and say, Subhana Rabbi al A'la wa bihamda? When I am able to see, is that not enough for me to say, Subhana Rabbi al A'la wa bihamda? When I see poor people in the world, is that not enough for me to fast the whole month of Ramadan? When I see those who have nothing, is that not enough for me to give sadaqa? Notice what happens is that at the beginning you start with fear. Is there a problem? No. In the Quran, Allah talks of khawf. But khawf shouldn't be where you end. Khawf should be where you start. Imam Ali says, first type of worshippers, those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of fear. This is the worship of a slave. A slave is scared of the master. Yeah? But sometimes khawf is good because respecting one's elders is amazing. So how about respecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? True? So on the one hand, the lowest is fear. Then Mawla says, a group worship Allah out of desire for reward. That is the worship of tujjar, traders, businessmen. I think a lot of us fall in that category. <laughs> How many of us are like, so if I read that dua, do I get like 61 houses in Jannah? So, yeah. Oh, bring that dua quickly. Bring it, bring it. If I do this, I remember people used to come to me, they said, is it true there's a salah? That every qadha salah, you've, every prayer you've missed, if you pray the salah, all your qadhas are done. I said, I wish it was that easy. Wallah. Wallah, I wish it was that easy. Or if I told someone there's a salah istijara, you know, if your dad died and he has qadha, you can pay someone to pray the qadha prayer. Someone said, so how about me? I've missed. I said, no, no. You can't. Everyone wants something where there's a reward. Even for Allah, I, I say this with all due respect, these ISIS, when they were killing people, said, so why you kill the Shia? said, because I'm going to have breakfast with Rasulullah in Jannah. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Amazing. Wallah al -azim. Amazing. Amazing. Others, they were asked, why do you do ibadah? Because there is Hur al -Ain waiting for us. For some reason, dua reciters in Ramadan, when they get to Hur al -Ain, you hear everyone saying, Ameen! <laughs> Relax, Baba. Your wife is going to stick with you in Jannah, I'm telling you from now. 
your wife is going to stick with you in Jannah. She's not leaving. Because there's the hadith that says, if someone's wife is a mu'mina in this world, Allah will make her more beautiful than the Huris in Jannah. You guys are all stuck. <laughs> but again, look at the philosophy. <laughs> look at the philosophy of worship. Philosophy is, what reward will I get? So if I put the Quran on my head 10 times, is it true that they say all my sins are de deleted, said Ammar? Is it true? Yes. Okay, I'm going to be there. What time is uh, putting Quran on the head? 10.47. Khaja timing, because it's never rounded off. 10.47. Wallah. <laughs> Wallah, when I see Khoja timing, I remember when I lectured in the Ismaili Jama'at Khana in Toronto. I lectured in the Jama'at, they have a beautiful Jama'at Khana in, in Toronto. And uh, I met a man called a Muki. I was like, Muki? I've heard that before. Muki? Oh my God, if not Ashari Khoja took it from Ismail. Okay. Muki said to me, if I remember the timings properly, that lecture was on uh, Eid al Ghadir. I lectured. Abu Talib, Eid al Ghadir, that time. And it said to me, Your lecture from 7 40 until 8 23. <laughs> 8 what? I said, Now I know where the Khaja come from. Now I know. Now I know their history. You don't need to give me no Khaja heritage programs. This guy just showed it to me. 823 bro round it off to the nearest decimal round it off 825 no 823 because the MC has to conclude for two minutes after you <laughs> anyway so the person says if I put Quran on my headset Ammar are all my sins deleted completely deleted Habibi but that's not why you're doing it you're doing it to rebuild your relation with the Quran Quran on the head is me saying, have I neglected this book on my head? Do I only put it on my head in, 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 in Laylatul Qadr? Have I read Quran recently? Have I read Tafsir of Quran? Have I pondered on the ayahs of the Quran? Or am I going to become like the children of Israel who were like donkeys carrying luggage? The donkey when it carries books, it doesn't know what it's carrying. So therefore, this I put on my head. Why do I read, for example, Dua Abu Hamza Thamali to remind me of the bounties of Allah and the wonders of Allah and the blessings of Allah? The second group, what are they? They're the ones who do all of it for Jannah. Again, it's not a problem. I want to reiterate. Those on the group who do it out of fear, it's not haram what you're doing, but try and get further this Ramadan. Yes? Because takhweef and targheeb are both in the Quran. In the Quran, Allah in Surah 3 verse 133 Surah Al Imran verse 133 God says race towards forgiveness from Allah and Jannah I'm going to turn around to Allah and say Ya Allah Ali ibn Abi Talib says the second type of people they do things because they want Jannah you in the Quran are telling us do things so you get Jannah yes Allah does say that do things so you get Jannah but don't let it be the end of your spiritual journey First, you do things out of fear, that's respectful. Second, because you want Jannah, again, it's a good level. But then Mola says, but the highest level. What's the highest level? There are those who worship Allah because what? Out of gratefulness. They found Allah worthy of being worshipped. That is the worship of a free human being. How beautiful, Mola. Look at what Mawla is really doing. He's saying, Wallah, if there was no heaven and there was no hell, I would still say thank you for what you've given me. I would still say thank you, O oh Allah, for what you've given me. You gave me parents and others did not have parents. You allowed me to gain education and others did not gain education. You allowed me to have a house and there are kids in the world with no homes. You allowed me, Ya Allah, to know Muhammad and Al Muhammad, to know their household as a follower of theirs. Ya Allah, if Jannah or Jahannam didn't even exist, I would still bow down and say, Subhana Rabbi Al A'la wa bihamdi. That ibadah, what is it? That is the ibadah of free human beings. 
It is the highest level. What did I say in the gym example? Either I do it because I'm scared of a heart attack. Or I do it because of what? Because I want to just try and get the rewards of it. But the highest level is whether I get rewards, I don't get rewards. I'm going to do it to look after myself and be free. Likewise with God. God, whether there's a hell, whether there's a heaven, at the end of the day, you, O oh Allah, have been so kind to me. I don't want to ever be separated from your mercy. And that's where Mawla and Nahj and, and Dua Kumain, you'll always see those lines. I don't mind being separated. For example, from you, but from your mercy, I cannot be separated. How can I be separated from the look towards your generosity? How could you put us in hell if putting us in hell is going to be away from you? That level is what? That level is when you reach a level where when someone tells you pray, and if you don't pray, then tonight you won't get a reward. You could turn around to them and say, you know what? Even if Allah doesn't reward me, it's enough that I can talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ali Shari'ati used to say, if everybody in the world leaves you, you'll always have Allah with you. True? Everybody may leave me. Everybody may neglect me. But I'll always have Allah as a friend. Isn't it an honor? Enough for me when it comes to namaz that I could talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you ever thought about that? There are people you try and email them, only their secretary replies. Allah says, There are people. Wallah, you email them. Secretary replies. I want to speak to the CEO. Who are you to speak to the CEO? But the CEO of the heavens and the earth replies to me. And the CEO of the heavens and the earth is Sami'. He is Basir. He listens to me. And he says, When my servant asks you about me, tell them I am near. I answer the supplication of the supplicant when he supplicates towards me. Therefore, the meaning of life was what? Was to find happiness. That happiness came in a manifesto called Islam, which answered my physical needs and answered my spiritual needs and gave me a journey and a timetable and told me which sets I had to perform form five times a day in namaz what are they you know in gym you have reps don't you have reps you have sets why are those things there for us why why do i have to do them three times sometimes the instructor says four by twelve isn't that true four by twelve say baba instructor can't i just do one twelve i have to do say you get on there now a second set a third set a fourth set how many of you played football in your life how many times you do drills there are some managers who are known for their drills. A drill, a defensive drill, another drill. Baba, we've defended this corner in the same way 15 times. Again, another drill. Why? Because he wants your physical body to be at that top level. The drills in Islam were the ibadat of Psalm and Siyam. Yes? What is fasting? Fasting on the lowest level, keeping away from food and drink. On the highest level, to keep away from ghibah and hasad. On a higher level, to conserve energy that when you break your fast, so that you're able to then with your fast, talk to Allah in dua and amal. You see the different levels. In other words, in our lives, us doing drills for our physical bodies, our ibadat are the drills and the reps and the sets for our soul. For our spiritual bodies, Allah said, do the reps on those machines for your gym. Do the same ones for your soul with what I've asked you to do with the ibadat. I ask all of you here, how many of us have had that moment in one ibadah where our heart softened and humbled us? How many of you? Wallah, in my own life, it, there's no feeling when one day you're alone at home. In namaz shab and you begin to cry when the whole family is asleep. Why? What was the aim of that ibadah? It humbled me. It made me realize how lucky I am. It reminded me at any second I could go. So what an honor it is that I could talk to you, O oh Allah, when everyone else is not answering my messages tonight. My Lord, you are the one who can hear me. The aim of worship, therefore, was what? was that it humbles us and makes us grateful for what our Lord. What was the highest level? Is that when you do something, you don't do it out of fear of hell, nor because you want heaven. Ahl al-Bayt displayed this one day when they were fasting. Fasting, Shahr Ramadan, but they were fasting a different fast. Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein, alayhim as-salam, were not feeling well. When they weren't feeling well, 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Bibi Fatima and Imam Ali. He said to them, make a mannat, a nidr, a vow, that if they get better for three days in a row, you will fast. On the first day when someone knocked at their door, did they give their food away? Yes. Second day, did they give their food away? Imagine you're about to break your fast. Wallah, us guys, when we're about to break our fast, 8 o'clock, someone comes and knocks at my door, says, I want all your food. I swear, I'll tell him, listen, mate, get out of here. I've been starving the whole day. I've been dying for coffee, dying for water, dying for amongst many other things. But Ahlul Bayt said, no, miskeen, yateem, and asir. But do you know what's amazing about what the Quran said about what they did on those three days? <inaudible> what we have given today is not because we're scared of hell, not because we want Jannah. <inaudible> what we've done, which has made us free human beings. And that is what? And that is that we do it. For the sake of Allah. La nuridu minkum jaza'an wa la shukura. We don't want from you any reward nor any thankfulness. How many of us when we do ibadah, you want to know if you're doing proper worship in Islam? Do you want everyone to heap praise on you? Or are you happy if Allah heaps praise on you? Izza, I'm telling you all one secret. Izza doesn't come from the people. It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Izza? Doesn't come from the people. The people, huh, one day the one who hates you now loves your majalis. And one day the one who loves your majalis can turn and hate you. All in one second. Depends on whether your opinion agrees with his, not whether your opinion is haq. However, Izzah comes from Allah. Ahlul Bayt highlighted true worship is when you're content that God is proud of you, not the people. Your ibadah for the people, let the people reward you. But when your ibadah is for Allah, then it brings you that peace. And that's why on Ashura, what did you find? There is a critical moment from Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. The pursuit of happiness is not confined to me as a Muslim, it's to every human. True? All humans. The purpose, meaning behind them being here. One way or the other, why Allah created me? All I could say is I'm going to find the pursuit to find my Lord and find happiness. On the plains of Karbala, there is this moment which requires critical analysis as a majlis by itself. He was lying on the earth of Karbala. Arrows were all over his body. It is, a, it is one of the most heartbreaking moments you'll ever see. But what's great about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is the ability to continue to be while his physical body is bleeding, his mind was in perfection. If ever anyone doubted the physical soul conundrum, look at Hussein bin Ali in Karbala. Arrows all over his body. He's on the ground, he's thirsty. Imagine. And there is a moment when Shimmer says, attack their woman. How many injuries are all over his body? And how amazing Abba Abdullah is, until the last moment, you get lessons from his words. What a lesson on life, on the pursuit of happiness to people who don't even believe. Look, look what he said to them. O oh, army of Yazid, if you don't believe in God or a day of judgment, at least be free humans. Why attack the woman? Don't believe in God. Don't believe in the day of judgment. But one thing you should never do, even if you're a human who's not a Muslim, don't attack these ladies. Yes, these are ladies. You don't have to believe in Allah, you don't have to believe in my grandfather, but don't touch these ladies. They don't deserve to be treated in that way. What was his concern? His concern wasn't Islam. His concern was that you as a human actualize your potential. Actualize and then meet Allah. Allah then judges where you go. But you as a human don't let yourself down. I ask you who would come out with such words when they're dying and bleeding?
But then I saw his brother by the Forat recite poetry when he had lost his arms. And if his brother could do that, am I surprised that Imam Al Hussein could say what he said? But alas, they attacked his ladies, no doubt. He had passed away. They decided to burn the tents of the ladies of Al Muhammad. Those men were no longer men. Those men had lost the meaning of freedom, the meaning of understanding God. They all claimed the army of Umar bin Sa'ad, La ilaha illallah, but a man of La ilaha illallah, with no reflection and dry ibadah, can result in them chasing a young girl from ten to ten. Hamid bin Muslim narrates, he said, I saw a girl. She was running from ten to ten. Her dress was on fire. Yes. He said, I came to her and I looked towards her and I said to her at that moment, here, take some water. Your dress is on fire. She looked at me and she said, are you with us or are you against us? He said that I looked at her, I said, I'm neither with you nor am I against you. She said, you offer me water and my father lay thirsty on Karbala's plains. Then she looked at him, she said to him, oh man, have you recited the Quran? Do you know the Quran? He said to her, yes, I know the Quran. Subhanallah, a man who knows the Quran is watching as people kill the family of the Quran. Imagine, imagine if a person's ibadah has no reflection, what can happen to you as a Muslim? That man, he says to her, yes, I know the Quran. She said, may I ask you a question? He said to her, go ahead. She said to him, have you read the ayah of the Quran? Quran, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Fam al Yatim, Falatakar. As for the orphan, do not hurt the orphan. He said to her, Yes, I've read the ayah. She said, Anna Yatim at Al Hussein, Alayhi Salam. I am the orphan of Imam Al Hussein, Alayhi Salam. Then she said to him, Have you read the ayah in the Quran? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You've read the first one yes when someone asks you something don't reject it he said to her yes I know the ayah she said may I ask you a question he said go ahead she said direct me direct me towards the land of Najaf Allahu Akbar direct me towards the land of Najaf so I may complain to my grandfather about the way they've treated the lady Ladies on this night, I want to tell him, my grandfather, where were you when they took Akbar's body one way and the other? Where were you when the arrow hit the six month old baby's neck? Where were you, where were you when Shimmer sat on his chest? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ya Allah, raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Allow us to be amongst the companions of Imam Sahib Al Asri Wa Zaman. We pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for the originators of this majlis. Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst those who are the closest to the Lord, who talk to the Lord, and the Lord answers our du'as. Ya Allah, we pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala with the Surah Al Fatiha in honor of all the marhumin of those who've attended the majlis on this night, but before it, wherever you may be, the loudest of your salawat. Watch.